for the moms who raised us up, gave us love, and made us strong. For the praying moms who don't always know what to do, but always know who to talk to. For the hurting moms who've loved and lost, but never given up. For those who never got called mom, but who cared for us all like a mom would. For the young moms who became moms sooner than expected and gave it all they had. For the single moms who tirelessly and courageously learned how to do this on their own. For the stepmoms and the stand-in moms who rose to the occasion and loved us well. For the working moms, the stay-home moms, the cooking moms, and the takeout moms, thank you for teaching us how to walk, how to learn, and how to make a difference. For taking care of us when you barely had enough time to take care of yourself. For comforting us when we felt alone and afraid. For lifting us up when others put us down. For the rides, the meals, the laundry, and the birthday parties. For the years, tears, laughter, and love. It's not enough, but we want to say thank you. for doing for us what we could never do for ourselves. We love you. We honor you. We remember you today. Happy Mother's Day. So we're here to listen to the word and uh, it's a wonderful, wonderful day to celebrate mothers, but we want to celebrate Christian mothers today, and we want to celebrate mothers of truth. So if you can turn in your Bibles to 2 John, 2 John, and uh, Tom read from uh, 1 John chapter 3, which uh, we have already studied, but we're, we're going now, we're moving on. We did our series in the book of 1 John, so now we're going to look at the entire book of 2 John, which is just 13 verses. Well, before I went on holidays, like you remember, we were doing a series on the book of 1 John, and we have more or less made our way through that epistle, and I was wanting to do all three epistles. So I started reading through Second John again, and I thought, what a great Mother's Day sermon. Uh, and so we're going to call this sermon today, A Mother of Truth. A Mother of Truth. Well, I re recently came across a bunch of Mother's Day cards that were written by seven and eight year olds. And uh, here are some of the things that they said. Angie, she wrote this about her mom. She said, dear mom, I'm going to make dinner for you on Mother's Day. It's going to be a surprise. P.S. I hope you like pizza and popcorn. <laughs> Robert wrote, I got you a turtle for Mother's Day. I hope you like the turtle better than the snake I got you last year. <laughs> Eline wrote, Dear Mom, I wish Mother's Day wasn't always on Sunday. It would be better if it were on Monday so we wouldn't have to go to school. <laughs> Little Diane wrote, I hope you like the flowers I got you for Mother's Day. I picked them myself when Mrs. Smith wasn't looking. <laughs> and the last one is from Carol. She wrote, Dear Mom, here are two aspirins. Have a happy Mother's Day. 
main reason why I'm calling this sermon a mother of truth is because it's pretty obvious that in our culture and in our world today, God's truth is under attack on many different levels. And I know I've said a lot about this over the last little while, especially when it comes to the family and to motherhood and womanhood and fatherhood and manhood. God's design is being questioned and distorted and his truth is being perverted all over the place. The, even now there are some seemingly intelligent people who are saying things now like men can get pregnant. If you're a trans person who is biologically female but you now identify as a man, you can still be a mother and get pregnant. That's the kind of world we live in and that, that blurring and that distortion has really just started happening in the last few years. If someone had have said that 20, 30 years ago, you would have thought they were completely insane. That's becoming standard now. That's becoming mainstream. Kate Miller, a feminist writer in her book, Sexual Politics, writes, the family must go because it is the family that has oppressed and enslaved women. David Copper, a British doctor, in his book, The Death of the Family, says the best thing society could do is to abolish the family altogether. This is a doctor. And over the years and the centuries, the main strategy of Satan is to confuse and distort and deny and corrupt the truth, especially when it comes to God's design especially when it comes to the family. And that's why it's so important for us to know the truth when it relates to those areas as Christians today and to be able to distinguish and discern between truth and error. Because so often the battle is a spiritual one. Amen? It's a battle for our minds and our souls and our attitudes. And the battleground starts with us personally individually and then in our homes and in our families and in our churches and then it spreads out to our schools and out to society as a whole and especially as believers and parents and christian christian grandparents and especially as we think of christian mothers today we need to be guardians of the truth for our homes and our families and our churches and if we're not being vigilant and aware, and if we don't read our Bibles, and if we're not listening to the word regularly, and we're not growing in our faith, if we don't really know what we believe, then we're going to be easy pickings. And we're going to pass that apathy and that disposition on to the next generation. Did you know that there is a new term? I think I've mentioned this before, and some of you know. There's a new term on university campuses these days. It's called microaggression. If someone on campus sneezes and you said, God bless you, that might be considered a microaggression because you're not being very sensitive to that person who sneezed because that person who sneezed might not believe in God and you're saying God bless you because that person might have another religion or another belief system and you're forcing your beliefs and your God on them. And to think that, especially in the States, a lot of universities like Princeton and Yale and Harvard all started hundreds of years ago as Christian institutions. But now everything is relative. I have my truth, you have your truth. And don't you dare share your truth with me. That's, and yet the world shares their truth with us all the time and forces it down our throats. How in the world did all of that happen? You know, as we get older and we turn around and we think, and it's happening so quickly. Where did all this distortion and this perversion come from? It's because the Christian foundations, godly principles, moral values, biblical truth, standards, 
Christian standards, social standards that Western culture was built on are now continually being eroded and attacked and watered down. And then there are, there, there's no, no rock, there's no foundation, no moorings. And at the same time, all this change has been happening in our culture. And I think with the pandemic and world events, it's just speeding up. At the same time that we're seeing this unbelievable change in our society and in our thinking, people in general and families and parents and individuals are literally dying for truth. And we've noticed that through this pandemic. People are searching for hope. They're searching for a foundation. They're searching for substance. They're searching for answers and purpose and reality. And we've had such a vivid reminder of this over the last couple of years. So many people today are lost emotionally and spiritually, and they're living in a state of fear and hopelessness, and they're searching for answers, and they're searching for truth. And that's why today, all of that to say, that's why today we need mothers who won't be afraid to stand up and be counted. We need mothers who will know their Bibles and know that foundation and know the truth of God's word and then live it out and model it and pass it on and teach and train their kids and make a difference in their home and in their family and in their world. And now we come to Second John. And so we're going to read Second John together. So if you have your Bibles, we'll read the entire book. We'll slog through it, all 13 verses. It says, The elder to the lady chosen by God and to her children whom I love in the truth. And not I only, but also all who know the truth, because of the truth which lives in us and will be, will be with us forever. Grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and from Jesus Christ the Father's Son will be with us in truth and love. It has given me great joy to find some of your children walking in the truth just as the Father commanded us. And now, dear lady, I am not writing you a new command, but one we have had from the beginning. I ask that we love one another, and this is love, that we walk in obedience to his commands. As you have heard from the beginning, his command is, to walk, is that you walk in love. And of course, John has repeated that throughout 1 John, and then now into 2 John. He says, I say this because many deceivers who do not acknowledge Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh have gone out into the world. Any such person is the deceiver and the antichrist. Watch out that you do not lose what we have worked for, but that you have, may be rewarded fully. Anyone who runs ahead and does not continue in the teaching of Christ does not have God. Whoever continues in the teaching has both the Father and the Son. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, mothers, do not take them into your house or welcome them. Anyone who welcomes them shares in their wicked work. I have much to write to you, but I do not want to use paper and ink. Instead, I hope to visit you and talk with you face to face so that our joy may be complete. The children of your sister who is chosen by God send their greetings. It says in the first part of verse one here, the elder. So we know this is the Apostle John, the disciple John, but he refers to himself as the elder. He says to the chosen lady and her children whom I love in the truth. Now the disciple John, writing all three epistles, uh, he's probably elderly at this point, so he refers to him self as the elder, but it's also because of his position in the church. He's a pastor, an overseer, an elder. He's a spiritual leader, and he's writing to someone he calls the chosen lady and her children. We could say the chosen mother and her children. 
Now, there are two ways that we could interpret this introduction. Some scholars think that this is just another way of him addressing a local church. And it's kind of code. Maybe John wants to stay anonymous because of the Roman authority. So he uses the term elder. He doesn't use his own name. And he uh, then uses the term the chosen lady, which could mean a church. And the children could be the members of that church. That's one way of interpreting this. But looking at the context, as I went over this, and I've done some research, especially when John says, whom I love in the truth. It seems kind of personal. And the more natural interpretation, I think, is that John is actually writing to a family, to a special friend, to a mother, to her children, the chosen lady. And so in some ways, this is actually a letter to a mom. What a good passage to have on Mother's Day. Right from the Word of God. And it's all about being a mother of truth. He talks about here, and I've said this many times before, and I know we don't have too many people out today, but I believe more than ever that in the church, church in general, and in our church specifically, if you are not a physical mother, if you're a single person, or if you don't have children, you can still be a spiritual mother. That is so biblical. It is so biblical. In Titus, it talks about the older women teaching the younger women. And if you're, if you're older and you think, well, I don't have anything to do at church. I don't have a title. I don't have a role. I'm just lying here on the shelf. You can be a spiritual mother. As Tom has shared, we all need mothers and we need spiritual mothers who will mother us spiritually and set an example and help us and nurture us. Uh, we desperately need that today. So what I'd like us to do now is to examine our passage. And again, this passage applies generally to all of us. To, and especially today to mothers and grandmothers and spiritual mothers, but it applies to all of us, to men as well. Number one, the first encouragement, there's four encouragements here, and uh, we're gonna look at the first one here, and it is pretty straightforward. The first encouragement, encouragement is to know the truth, to know it. Look at verses one and two. It says, the elder to the chosen lady, and her children whom I love in the truth, and not I only, but also all who know the truth, because of the truth which lives in us and will be with us forever. So the truth here really means, I believe, the gospel, the good news about Jesus. And even in Christian churches today, if you were to go into some churches and ask them what the gospel was, they would give you a blank look. They would be like a deer in the headlights. Could you please tell me what the Christian gospel is? Duh. We want to know the gospel. And that's what he's talking about here. The truth, the basics of the gospel or the fundamentals of the faith, like we said earlier, the foundations. We're all challenged here to know our stuff, especially mothers, but all of us, to know what we believe, to know the truth about Jesus. If your child or grandchild or somebody in the church would ask you, oh, so what do you believe? What do you believe about Jesus? It's not good enough to say, well, talk to the pastor. And especially when we think about our families and our churches, the first step in raising kids is that they would know the truth, but that we would know the truth to begin with. We have to know the truth if we're going to share it. We have to be able to verbalize it. Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. God is holy. 
and we aren't. And that's why Jesus came to save us. That's why he came to deal with the sin problem. And when we turn to him and we repent and we return from our sins and we believe in him, he forgives us. He comes into our lives. He fills us with his Holy Spirit. He gives us the hope of heaven. That's the gospel. And if we don't repent, and if we don't put our faith in Christ, hell is waiting for us. There are many churches today that you will never hear the word H-E-L-L. -L. Never. Maybe in a curse word outside after the service, but you will never hear it preached. We believe in the historic Christian gospel, that there is a sin problem that we have. And if we don't deal with it, if we don't have it forgiven and taken away, we are headed to a lost eternity. I got a little sidetracked there. But anyways, we don't want to water down the truth. We want to share the whole gospel. And notice John calls this mother he's writing to a chosen lady. That means she's a believer. She's a Christian. She's chosen of God. It's the same idea as the word elect. God chooses us and he saves us and he calls us and we all have a special calling. We all have a job to do, especially mothers. And today as a Christian mother or a Christian grandmother, you are chosen of God. Don't ever believe that being a mother isn't worth all your sacrifice or that your life doesn't matter very much because you stayed home with the kids or no, God called you to do this. It just didn't happen by accident. He chose you. He didn't cho chose, choose anybody else. You were the one he chose to be a mother to your kids and to your family. Didn't choose your husband. He was chosen to be the father. He didn't choose daycare or a nanny. You are chosen of God. You have a God-given calling. And especially even, I was going to say even, but especially as a grandmother, you have an unbelievable calling to influence and to teach the truth to your grandkids. So in spite of what we've done or what we've been or where we came from, we can still be children of God, John says. That's a fact. That's a reality. Nothing can change that. That's why he says, and that is what we are. That is what we are. Not what we were. You wouldn't want to, you know, 45 years ago, you wouldn't want to uh, see me uh, to know what I was. No, it's what we are. God has chosen you. He's called you. He's given you this calling. And notice that John says that he loves this chosen lady, this chosen mother. And how does he love her? In the truth. And not only does he love her in the truth, but he says everybody who knows the truth loves her too. We support each other in the truth. We encourage each other. We come alongside and encourage mothers, meaning other Christians love her and respect her and admire the kind of mother she is. That should bind us together as a church family and unite us. And a mother should know that she's not alone, that she's loved not just by God, but by his people, by us. And, you know, if God starts bringing younger mothers back into our church, we want to reach out to them and support them and encourage them and be empathetic to what they're going through. We all love and respect mothers for what they're doing and not dismiss it or downplay it like the world does. Because love and truth should go hand in hand, of course. And as Christians, if we know the truth, doesn't just mean knowing it in our heads or intellectually or knowing key doctrines or knowing biblical facts. Knowing the truth means living it out, loving him, knowing him personally, knowing Jesus Christ, 
Some people think, oh, I'll send my kids to Sunday school or I'll send them off to church and maybe they'll get some religion and that'll be good for them. Well, that's not what knowing the truth or being a Christian is all about. The truth is that we are sinners. We need to be saved. We need to be forgiven. We need to be accepted by a holy God. It's about believing in Jesus and getting to know him personally and having a living, active faith and living it out, not just talking about it, sending your kids off to church. No, they have to see it in action. I've said it a million times, children learn by osmosis. You can blab, blab, blab. You can talk about things. You can recite even biblical things or memorize verses. And sometimes it's like the peanut, peanut commercials. Blah, 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 blah. It's just talk, it's just talk. We have to live it out. Our faith has to be active and alive because we believe in having a personal relationship with Christ. It's a living relationship. If we know him who is the truth, Jesus said he was the way, the truth, and the life. If we know him who is the truth, then we'll know his love too. And we'll put that love into practice. Jesus said you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Free from what? Free from worry as a mother or a grandmother or a spiritual mother. Free from fear. When you know the truth, it brings comfort and rest and peace and security and confidence in God. Knowing the truth and knowing Jesus sets us free to love. To love the way he loved. So if we know, know the truth, it sets us free to put it into practice. To love. To be practical. And for mothers, if you're growing in Jesus and you're growing in the truth, you'll grow in your love for him. And then you'll grow in your love for your kids and your, for your family and maybe even for your husband. I shouldn't have said it that way. Truth and love are directly related. But the bottom line for all of us today, everyone included, especially for mothers though, is we can't begin teaching our children or our grandchildren to know the truth unless we know it. Unless we're saved. Unless we put our faith into action, our faith in Jesus Christ. And unless we know him first, unless we've experienced in ourselves, we'll just be speaking fluff and wind and giving head knowledge. Knowing the truth means knowing Jesus and loving him and accepting him as our personal Lord and Savior and experiencing his love and his salvation, his forgiveness, and then living that out and sharing that truth and that reality and that love and that knowledge with our kids and with the next generation. Here's a great prayer for all of us this morning. From Psalm 25, verse 5, it says, Guide me in your truth and teach me, for you are God, my Savior, and my hope is in you all day long. Even through the ups and downs of life as a mother or a grandmother. I like that. Guide me in your truth and teach me my hope is in you all day long. And sometimes I remember back when we were raising kids, sometimes those days were pretty long all day long, if we are in the truth, if we are being guided by the truth and he is teaching us, we can have hope throughout those long days, no matter how full or how busy or how long my day is, my hope is in you. So that's the first encouragement here, to know the truth. That's number one. Then number two, the second encouragement for mothers and for all of us is another basic one, not just to know the truth, but to walk in the truth. That's the second point. Walk in the truth. Look at verses four to six. Four to six, it says, it has given me great joy to find some of your children walking in the truth. Just as the Father commands us, and now, dear lady, I am not writing you a new command, but one we have had from the beginning. I ask that we love 
one another, and this is love that we walk in obedience to his commands. As you have heard from the beginning, his command is that we walk in love. Sorry, John, what were you saying? He said it three times. Walking, walk, walk. Walk in the truth. And then John says here, I love this. He says that he has no greater joy than to see this lady's children walking in the truth. May that be your joy to see your grandchildren and your children and your family walking in the truth. That means they're just not religious. That means they're just not talking about it. They are walking daily, living it out. That means putting it into practice, being consistent where our words match our lifestyle and our behavior and our attitudes and where we're not just acting one way out in public and uh, we're a complete mess at home or one way at the church and another way on the job. And of course, children are only going to be walking in the truth if they have seen their mothers and their fathers and their parents modeling it. If they see that reality lived out in their parents' lives, they will follow suit many times. We might ask the question, why does it say walk and not run? Why doesn't it talk about running in the spirit or running in the truth? I remember when I was young, the lifeguards at the swimming pools in Toronto would always shout, walk, don't run. Why is walking in the Christian life so important? Because it's the idea of not sprinting, not being really good for, uh, for a couple of miles and then dying on, on, on the side of the path. It's the long haul. It's the marathon. It's a way of life, day in, day out. Pandemic in, pandemic out. Walking, it's over the long haul. Our kids learn that. They see that over the marathon of you raising them. They see our consistency and our steadiness and our true colors over the long haul. Here it says in verse six, to walk in obedience to his commands. If you say you love Jesus, you should obey him. You should walk in obedience. Jesus says in the Gospel of John 14, 15, we've quoted this before, if you love me, keep my commands. That's about as straightforward as possible. If you love me, keep my commands. And then in John 15, 10 and 2, 11, Jesus says, if you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. Isn't that a great promise? Standing on the promises. That's another great promise. If we're walking in the truth, if we're walking in obedience, he gives us joy. Not happiness based on how much money I have or based on circumstances, but a long-term internal joy and contentment and satisfaction. And our kids will pick up on that. I've shared a little bit about my sister and I don't want to say too much, but I remember having different talks with her through the years, especially when her brothers were all getting married and having families and children and different times she was very upset that she didn't have a family, that God didn't bring someone into her life and that she couldn't have children. Because if you knew Liz, or no Liz, she loves kids. She worked in daycare, she was a nanny for 10 years. She loves babies and children. And so as we would have these talks, I would say, you know, even if that's not going to be the reality in your life, God will make up the difference somehow. And you know what? She has all these people that she has, uh, influenced and has mothered in her own way that are now coming to visit her uh, from her past. 
this family that she was the nanny for, the two boys that she, she was with them for almost 10 years. Uh, they're now in their 20s going to university. They have come to visit her and, and, and still stay in touch uh, over the years. And so God has, has used her and has used her example and her influence and have give, has given her joy in spite of not having what she was wanting. And uh, God can do that in our lives too. And he can make the difference. We often live our lives as if only, if only this, if only that, if only I had an intact family, if only God can still give you joy in spite of it because of his truth. And we can be like that even in, in, in our church. If only we had a bigger church, if only we had programs, if only we had children, if only we had a Sunday school. God can still give us joy in spite of what we're lacking. If we are obedient and we follow his truth. And he talks here about having a full and complete joy. And you know, oftentimes, mothers included, we can get cranky and miserable. Our joy is anything but complete at times, and we become restless and unhappy, and we can't stand our lot in life. Why? Because we're usually not walking in obedience. We're doing our own thing, or we're going our own way, and then we wonder why we're not happy. We don't have joy. It says in verse 6, not just to walk in obedience, but to walk in love. And here again, if we're walking in the truth and we're reading our Bibles and we're staying close to the Lord and we're praying, we're obeying Him, we're living out our faith, we're practicing what we're learning, we're going to grow in our knowledge of Jesus and then we're going to grow in our love for Him. And then we're going to grow in love for others, for people around us, for our kids and our family. And again, it doesn't say running in love. It says walking in love. That means loving people over the long haul, even through stages. You, you know, when kids become teenagers, you think, oh, it's kind of hard. It's kind of hard to love the unlovable at times. But John is saying here, walking in love means loving people through the good times and the bad times and being patient and long-suffering and understanding day in and day out. Then number three, the third encouragement for mothers and for all of us here is to guard the truth. To know the truth, to walk in the truth, and then to guard the truth, verses seven to eight, it says, I say this because many deceivers who do not acknowledge Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh have gone into the world. Any such person is the deceiver and the antichrist. Watch out that you do not lose what we have worked for, but that you may be rewarded fully. So the context here is being on our guard against false teaching. And that's been a theme throughout the first epistle as well. Watch out, beware, and uh, concerning your family, what your family and you are, are listening to and being exposed to, because there are so many things, of course, in our world today. So many messages and influences that are deceptive and they promote falsehood and error. So many messages that are anti-Christian, anti-Christ, that go against God and all that he stands for. And back in John's day, it was false teachers going into homes and coming into the church and questioning the person of Jesus and questioning his deity and saying that he was just a phantom or a ghost, that he didn't really come in the flesh. And of course, today, we still have false teaching all around us. And it's the challenge to be on guard against that kind of thing coming into your life or coming into your home or into the church. And when we think about today, of course, the internet and the media and all the dangers that are out there today, this warning is to be on guard for all of us to watch out. Don't be taken in by Satan's schemes and all the deception that's out there today. And it's interesting that it says at the end of verse 8, Watch out that you do not lose what we have worked for. And if we apply that to mothers, watch out so you don't lose your kids to falsehood and deception. 
all that you have worked for, that you've built up. Watch out, be on guard. The enemy would love to come in and destroy our families. That's the target. Guard the truth. Don't let your children be deceived. The point here is to be vigilant and pray and teach and correct. And there's a promise in this verse. It says at the end of verse 8, but that you may be rewarded in full. What's a reward for a Christian mother? What's going to be your reward? Well, we've already talked about it. Yes, to see your children walking in the truth and not falling for the falsehood that's out there. To know the truth, for them to know the truth, to walk in the truth, and for them to guard the truth. That's your reward as a Christian grandmother or a Christian mother today. Number four, the fourth encouragement for mothers, and you always know when I get to number four, I'm getting to the end. I'm winding down. Number four is to continue in the truth. Know the truth, walk in the truth, guard the truth, and then continue in the truth. Verse nine says, anyone who runs ahead and does not continue in the teaching of Christ does not have God. Whoever continues in the teaching of Christ has both the Father and the Son. The idea is, of course, to continue. We, we see people in the Christian walk who start out with a bang and they, they look pretty good on paper, but they fall flat down the way. Has the same idea as abiding, continuing, remaining, being faithful, being solid, being grounded in the faith and in the truth. It's the same idea when Jesus talked about false teachers. He said, it's by their fruits that you're going to know them. As they continue, your, your good fruits are gonna show or your bad fruit is gonna show. Of course, that just means showing signs of growth, bearing fruit, demonstrating by your life that you're continuing in the faith and continuing in the teaching of Jesus. You're not running ahead of God and doing your own thing and falling for the latest spiritual fads. You're not being swayed by every little thing that comes along, but instead you're rooted and you're grounded in the things of the Lord and you're still going, you're still continuing, you're still hanging in there. We've done that as a church. We're still here. We're still continuing. Amen. And we want to keep going to the finish line. And that's what we want for our mothers. That kind of strength and perseverance and stamina and faithfulness speaks so much louder than what we could ever say. Oh, he's still there? She's still there? Oh, that's amazing. That mother put up with all that, and she's still there. And our kids look at us, and they look at our conviction, they look at our commitment, and they look at us hanging in there during the hard times and the storms of life, and they see something. They see that we're on solid ground, and we're not being blown around. We're not messed up. We're moving on. And our children say, that's what I want in my life. That's what I want to be like. That's the kind of stability that I want in my life. And I believe people all around us look at us and they see that kind of stability and they want it because their, their lives are so messed up. So my encouragement for all of us this morning especially for our mothers. So these four encouragements to know the truth, then to walk in it, to guard it, and to continue in it. And you know what will happen? You will get your reward as a spiritual mother, as a grandmother, or a physical mother. You will get your reward, and your children, the Bible says, will rise up and call you blessed. Amen? Amen and amen. For loving me before you even knew me. For caring 
for me from the moment I was born. For holding my hands that took my first steps. For taking time with me after a long day. for praying with me and for me. For not just being proud of me, for actually saying it. For holding me so tight and for letting me go. being the example I needed when it was finally my turn.